Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to live story time. My name is Miss Mary, and I hope you're all doing well today. Um, I, of course, am going to do a couple of spiels before I begin. Um, as always, I wait a little bit to see if anybody joins in um, before I start my stories. Today, um, I'm going to be reading stories that have more great, amazing female characters in them. And um, it's in honor of the last day of Women's History Month, which is today. Um, so it's been a great month of learning about all of these amazing women and um, reading stories about amazing girls. So um, I have five more books. Last week's um, just weren't enough. Um, so. As always, if you arrive, please say hello in the comments, and I will be sure to give you a shout out. Now, last week, I just want to mention that I noticed a couple of comments that um, I didn't see until I, I looked at the post after the program. So I don't know why I didn't see them during my story time, but I am so sorry for not giving a shout out to those people. Hopefully, if you're here, I will see your comment today. Um, just a couple of quick rules, not rules, but like reminders about the comments. There is a delay, so I don't see your comments right away. And apparently sometimes I don't see them at all, um, until the program is over. It's weird. But, um, please be patient because I will see, um, I will see your comment eventually and I'll be sure to give you a shout out. And also, I, if I'm in the middle of a story, when you say something in the chat, I wait until I'm done with the story before I answer. So I'm not ignoring you. I'm just reading my story, and then I'll get to you. So, oh, I see a comment from Laura. Hi, Sadie. Hi, Callie. Sadie wants to know if you saw our chick name suggestions. I have not. I don't know. What you what you suggested, but um, I do know that the three remaining chicks that need to be named are going to be named tonight. So um, those names are going to be picked out tonight. So good luck, girls. And if any of you don't know, before I start my stories really quick, if any of you don't know, we have live baby chicks at the library. You can watch the live video feed through our website, and I will link to our website in the comments right now. Um, and you can also come in and visit them. We have four baby chicks this year, and they're adorable. They hatched on Monday afternoon, Monday evening, uh, Monday night, and um, they're adorable, so please please either check out the live feed that's available through our website or come on in and we'll show them to you in person. Okay, let's get started with my first book of the day. As always, if you are here, please say hello in the chat and I will give you a shout out. Great, you watched the live feed. That's awesome, Sadie. I hope you watched it on your big TV and that, you know, that makes it even more exciting that you're watching it on this big screen, right? Okay. My first book of the day is called Extra Yarn by Mac Barnett. Okay, let me just make sure my angle is good. On a cold afternoon in a cold little town where everywhere you looked was either the white of snow or the black soot from chimneys, Annabelle found a box filled with yarn of every color. I love yarn. I love crocheting. I so she went home and knit herself a sweater. And when Annabelle was done, she had some extra yarn. So she, she knit a sweater for Mars, too, her dog. But there was still extra yarn. And when Annabelle and Mars went out for a walk, Nate pointed and laughed and said, you two look ridiculous. 
You're just jealous, said Annabelle. No, I'm not, said Nate. But it turned out he was. And even after she'd made a sweater for Nate and his dog, and for herself and for Mars, she still had extra yarn. At school, Annabelle's, Annabelle's classmates could not stop talking about her sweater. Quiet, shouted Mr. Norman. Quiet, everyone. Annabelle, that sweater of yours is a terrible distraction. I cannot teach with everyone turning around to look at you. Then I'll knit one for everyone, Annabelle said, so they won't have to turn around. Impossible, said Mr. Norman. You can't. <laughs> but it turned out she could, and she did, even for Mr. Norman. And when she was done, Annabelle still had extra yarn. So she knit sweaters for her mom and dad, and for Mr. Pendleton, and Mrs. Pendleton, and for Dr. Palmer, and for little Louis. She made sweaters for everyone except Mr. Crabtree, who never wore sweaters or even long pants, and who would stand in his shorts with the snow up to his knees. No sweater for me, thanks, said Mr. Crabtree. So she made Mr. Crabtree a hat, and even then, Annabelle still had extra yarn. She made sweaters for all the dogs and all the cats and for other animals, too. Soon, people thought, soon Annabelle will run out of yarn. But it turned out she didn't. So Annabelle made sweaters for things that didn't even wear sweaters, <laughs> like the mailbox and the house. Things began to change in that little town. Oh, look how bright and happy it is. News spread of this remarkable girl who never ran out of yarn. And people came to visit from around the world to see all the sweaters and to shake Annabelle's hand. One day, an archduke who was very fond of, colors, of clothes sailed across the sea and demanded to see Annabelle. Little girl, said the Archduke, I would like to buy that miraculous box of yarn, and I am willing to offer you one million dollars. Hmm. No, thank you, said Annabelle, who was knitting a sweater for a big pickup truck. The Archduke's mustache twitched. Two million, he said. Annabelle shook her head. No, thanks. Ten million, shouted the Archduke. Take it or leave it. Leave it, said Annabelle. I won't sell the yarn. And she didn't. So that night, the Archduke hired three robbers to break into Annabelle's house, and they stole the box and took it to the Archduke, who set off across the snow and sailed over the sea back to his castle. The Archduke put on his favorite song and sat in his best chair. Then he took out the box and he lifted its lid and he looked inside. Empty. His mustache quivered, it shivered, it trembled. The Archduke hurled the box out the window and shouted, Little girl, I curse you with my family's curse. You will never be happy again. But it turned out she was. That is the story of extra yarn. Okay. Sadie wants you to know that she suggested Bella and Milky for the chick names and Flower. Those are great names, Sadie. Good choices. We'll, we will let you know if your names are picked. And Sadie wants to know my favorite fruit again. This is a popular question from Sadie. Um, I don't mind answering it repeatedly every week. That's fine. Um, 
my favorite fruit is probably strawberries followed by watermelon. Those are my two favorites. I love pineapple too. Hi Margie. Hi Sammy. You have seen that chicks hatch too. That's great. I'm so glad you got to tune in and watch them being um, adorable on camera. They're just so cute. Um, okay. This next story is one that I really wanted to read last week, but um, I ran out of time. So this was a high priority for this week. This is called The Water Princess by Susan Verdi. And I just think the story is beautiful. And the um, illustrations are beautiful, too. I am Princess, Princess Gigi. My kingdom, the African sky, so wide and so close, I can almost touch the sharp edges of the stars. I can tame the wild dogs with my song. I can make the tall grass sway when I dance. I can make the wind play hide and seek, but I cannot make the water come closer. I cannot make the water run clearer no matter what I command. It, it is early morning, still dark. My mother wakes me. Gigi, my princess, it is time to get up. We must collect the water. Water, come. Do, do not make me wake before even the sun is out of bed, I demand. Come, please, I say but the water won't listen, and I know we will have to walk so far to the well. I am too sleepy to put on my crown. I think of the pot that will rest on my braids instead. The thirst comes quick, dry lips, dry throat. I squeeze my eyes shut. I see it, clear. I dip my toes in it, cool. I scoop it up and bring it to my lips. Slowly, I open my eyes. Nothing. Kick the dust. I grab my empty pot and place it upon my head. My mother does the same, and our journey begins, full of song. My mama adds her melody. Our steps are light. We twirl and laugh together. The miles give us room to dance. Halfway there, we stop for a moment at the giant kar kariti tree, long enough to grab a handful of sweet shea nuts for energy. We can keep the dance going just a little longer. Mama, are we there yet? Finally, I hear the water running from the well, the giggles of my friends, the chatter of women. Some have traveled farther than I, only to return home when the sun has gone to bed. Maman helps our place, holds our place while I play with friends. The dance continues. The water is flowing. Pots filling with the dusty, earth-colored liquid. Gigi, come. Maintenant. My turn now. Maintenant means now. In French. The dance home has slowed to careful steps, my thirst so heavy like the full pot I carry. Our song is softer now. Our shoulders ache, our feet cramp, but I see home at last. My mom boils enough water for drinking. We wait. We wash our clothes, we prepare food for cooking. My father comes quickly from the fields to share the drink and the meal. He scoops me up. My princess, you have returned with the water. Drink, Mama says. Finally. Every sip fills me, fills me with energy. I want to make it last, but I can't. I gulp it down. 
clothes and body clean. I sing to the dogs. I dance with the tall grass. I hide from the wind. Maman brings one last cup she has saved just for me. Drink, my princess. Sleep, my princess. Tomorrow we journey again. Mama, I say as I close my eyes, why is the water so far? Why is the water not clear? Where is our water? Sleep, she says. Dream, she says. Someday you will find a way, my princess. Someday. I am Princess Gigi. My kingdom, the African sky, the dusty earth, and someday the cool, flowing, crystal clear water. Someday. And that is the story of the water princess. Now, Gigi and her mama have so much work to do just to get to water. And it's not even clean water when they get there. They have to bring it home with them, carry it on their, on their heads in these big jugs. And then they clean the water when they get home. So, so much work for that water. It's amazing how much work goes into that. So Sadie wants to know your favorite fruit again. Oh, wait, I covered that. Pineapple is Sadie's daddy's favorite. Sadie and my favorite is watermelon. And Callie's favorite is apple. Oh, I like apples too, Callie. Um, Sadie says, I'm the best in the town. Wow, thanks, Ka thanks so much, Sadie. That, that means a lot to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think you're pretty swell too. And Callie wants to know again if I like fruit. Yes, confirmed. I love fruit, Callie. Absolutely. Maybe another question for me. I'm just thinking about it. My favorite vegetable. I don't know if we've talked about that in a few weeks. So, um, okay, let's keep going. This one is, I was almost going to save this one for uh, Earth Day, like an Earth Day story time, but I wanted to read it today. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so this is called Rocket Says Clean Up by Nathan Bryan. Now, we read a rocket book, I believe, earlier in the summer. Like, well, it was definitely last year. So I was excited that there's another rocket book because I really like her spunk. Okay. Here we go. I can't sleep tonight. I'm too excited because tomorrow, me, my mom, and my big brother Jamal are going on vacation to see my Grammy and Grampy. It feels as though we've been packing forever, but now we're ready to go. I'm going to be fist bumping a turtle, dancing with a dolphin, high-fiving an octopus, and surfing the waves like awesome Imani Wilmot. Did you know Imani Wilmot created the first female surf competition in Jamaica? How cool is that? As soon as we arrive, I give my Grammy and Grampy a huge hug. Looks beautiful where they live. My grandparents are the best. They run whale watching tours and have an animal sanctuary behind their house. I can't wait to help. Grampy tells me we never touch wild animals unless they need to be rescued or cared for. It's good advice, Grampy. But first, it's time to surf. My granny is really good. Then, Mom and I built a huge sand castle. Oh no, a baby turtle has washed up on shore, all tangled in plastic. I pick her up gently and take her to Grammy and Grampy. I know they can fix this. Grammy says she will try her best and takes her back to the sanctuary. Oh, plastic is ruining these islands, Rocket, says Grampy sadly. We save as many creatures as we can, but some still stay away. People used to come here to see the whales, but we haven't spotted a whale in a long time. He leads me down the beach. Oh, look at how messy it is. It feels as though there is more plastic than there is sand. I feel really sad. We need to do something, but what?
The next day at the beach, there are people playing in the sand, swimming in the sea, and eating popsicles, but all I notice now is the plastic. Surely they see it too? I need to let everyone know. Did you know whales eat the plastic and it makes them sick? Did you know nearly half the trash in the sea comes directly from careless people? Did you know that there are over 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean? Soon we have lots of new friends who want to help. As the day goes on, more and more people join. We spend the whole day cleaning the beach. Even Jamal helps. The cleanup crew is amazing. And soon the beach is clean. Look what all that teamwork did. But now what do we do with all the plastic we collected? Teresa, part of the cleanup crew, has a brilliant idea. My mom is an artist. Maybe we could get her to create something out of it. Yes, what a great idea. Teresa's mom makes awesome bins for the trash out of the trash we collected. Look what she made, how cool is that? And the cleanup crew makes the front page of the newspaper and the TV news. Now, no one will forget why we need to clean up. Everyone on the island wants clean beaches. Everyone on the island wants clean water. Everyone on the island wants to bring back the whales. The next day, Grammy and Grampy have a barbecue for the whole cleanup crew. Grammy's special, the smell of Grammy's special sauce wafts around the island. And best of all, while everyone's talking and laughing and eating, Grampy and I release the turtle we rescued back into the sea and watch as she swims away. She's all better now. And I just know one day the whales will come back. Grampy says, did you know one day you are going to change the world, Rocket? And I think she, I think he's right. I think Rocket has the power to save the world because look what she did. She organized that cleanup crew and got people concerned about all of the plastic on the beach and they made it better. That's so awesome. Now we want to know your favorite vegetable. Sadie's is peas. Okay, my favorite vegetable is, hmm, okay. I have a few, so I'm just gonna name a few that I really love. I love carrots. Um, crunchy, like raw or cooked. I like, I like peas too. I wouldn't say they're my favorite, but I like peas. I love asparagus and I love Brussels sprouts. Those, those are my favorites. Um, carrots, asparagus, Brussels sprouts. But I like most vegetables actually. Um, yeah, just a vegetable kind of girl. Okay, this is probably going to be my last book of the day. Um, I had five, don't think I'll have time for five. So this is called Ada Twist Scientist by Andrea Beatty. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, said not a word to the day she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around, observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and make, made her big break with a trail of chaos left in her wake. She ran through the day, chasing each sound and sight, and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. Her parents were frazzled, but tried not to freak as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly, young Ada, with lots in her head, would have something to say when it ought to be said. That's just what happened when Ada turned three. She tore through the house on a fact-finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, Stop! as all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she did not cry. 
She took a deep breath and she simply asked, why? So why was Miss Ada's first word? Why does it tick and why does it talk? Why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? Why are there pointy things stuck to a rose? Why are there hairs inside of your nose? She started with why and then what, how, and when. By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her dazed parents smiled at the curious thoughts of their curious child. Who wanted to know what the world was about? They kissed her and whispered, we'll figure it out. Her parents kept up with, her, with their high-flying kid, whose questions and chaos both grew as she did. Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this much was clear about Miss Ada Twist. She had all the traits of a great scientist. Ada was busy that first day of spring testing the sounds that make mockingbirds sing when a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie, said Ada, which got her to thinking, what is the source of that terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell? And does it still stink if there's no nose, if there's no nose to, to tell? She rattled off questions and tapped on her chin She'd start at the start where she ought to begin. A mystery, a riddle, a puzzle, a quest. This was the moment that Ada loved best. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling and smells, both the stinky and good. One hypothesis Ava thought could be true. This terrible stink came from dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ada knew it was time to come up with hypothesis two. Then, zowie, the stink struck again just like that. Hypothesis two, it's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make much of a stink of it on its own. It needed perfume and some can fancy cologne. So young Ada tested, but the test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, stop! Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair now by the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated, frazzled, and mad. Why, Ada questioned. Her mother said no. What, Ada queried. Her father said go. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough with your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. She sat all alone by herself in the hall, and Ada, once more, could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat, and she sat, and she sat, and she thought about science, and Stu, and the cat, and how her experiments made such a big mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Our mess is a problem, and while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what all scientists do. She asked a small question, and then she asked two. And that each of those led her to three questions more, and some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, she really dug in. She scribbled her questions and tapped on her chin. She started at why, and then what, how, and when. At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. Her parents calmed down, and they came back to talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair was now the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid who wanted to know what the world was about? They smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out.
And that's what they did because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and a heart that is true. They remade their world. Now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asks lots of questions. How could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. And as for that smell, what can Ada Twist do but learn all she can with her friends in grade two? Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is the question. And someday, who knows? So that is the story of Ada Twist Scientist. So, I love that story. She didn't have much to say at first, but when she when she finally said something, it was questions, and she just kept having more and more questions, which is a perfect trait for a scientist. So, um, Laura loves Brussels sprouts too. Good to hear. I'm in good company with that. Sadie says, "Thank you for being Miss Mary," and also wants to know if I like Frozen. First of all, thank you, Sadie. I'm so glad that I can um, be Miss Mary. It's an honor. And I do like Frozen. Yes, I like the music from Frozen. I like the movie. I like the animation. Yes, love Frozen. And I have two little girls in my life, my great nieces, who also love Frozen. Um, very, very big fans of dressing up like Elsa and Anna. So, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this week for another live story time. I am so glad that you could be here today to hear my stories. As always, um, I will see you next week with more stories. Um, so everyone stay well, stay healthy, stay safe. Enjoy the weather when it's not raining out, which I think it's supposed to today. But hopefully we'll get some nice sunny days up ahead. Um, enjoy those. And I will see you next week with more stories. Bye, everyone.